And I'll just give everyone a few seconds to filter in. <laughs> And while people are filtering in, I'll start by saying hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the Long-Term Animal Research Seminar Series. We continue this set of seminars with talks from Dr. Lu Luis Camacho and Dr. Leticia Aviles. If you're Before we introduce the speaker, I'll make a couple of announcements. Uh, if you're participating via Zoom, you should see the Q&A tab on the top or bottom of your screen. If you open the tab, you'll be able to type any questions that you have, as well as see and upvote other people's questions. And so we encourage you to use that tab to uh, write down questions during the talk. And at the end of the talk, we'll go through those questions, starting with the ones with the most votes. All of the talks will be available on YouTube shortly after they conclude. So if you need to leave early or know others who are unable to attend live, this talk will be available for viewing and reviewing after it's complete. So to start, I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Luis Camacho. Luis received his PhD from the University of British Columbia and has stayed on as a research coordinator. Luis's work, Luis's work asks diverse questions about insect populations using extensive fieldwork, careful behavioral assays, modeling, and community-based interviews. His research includes questions about macroevolutionary patterns and predation rates in the Andes, how learning drives mutualisms in predators and prey, and the effects of anthropogenic disturbance on insect populations. I'm really excited to welcome Luis today to hear more about his work. So with that, take it away. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. All right, let me just share my presentation right now. Um, share screen. All right, are we on? Looks great, you're just not at your first slide. Oh, don't, don't go to the second slide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't go to the third. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't go to the fourth. Okay, there we go, there we go. All right. Perfect. All right, there we go, okay. So hello everyone. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, how long-term biodiversity uh, data from museum collections can reveal links between, sorry, sorry, can, can reveal links between macroecological gradients in biotic interactions and, and, broad, uh, and broad biodiversity, by broad biodiversity patterns. Um, I'm going to turn off my video because it's the connection is a little off, okay? There we go. All right, so let's move on. So one of the big challenges in ecology is to understand the global patterns of biodiversity, such as those, such as those that occur across macro, macroecological gradients. So changes, this is, changes, changes in the strength of biotic interactions have been proposed to play a role in shaping such patterns. For example, predation is known to, to be less frequent at higher elevations and latitudes. But it is unclear what, what are the consequences of, 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 of such gradients in communities. So one of the best tools to study such questions is, is in what is, I, I think, perhaps the, the largest undertaking of long-term data sets in biology. And this is, this is the recording of biodiversity in museum collections. You see that the, the largest and oldest collections in the world have, have been recording biodiversity data over centuries. And, and this is the case, for example, of the Smithsonian Institution or, or the Natural History Museum in London, among many other, on many other museums, right? So with this in mind, uh, we took advantage of, of two 4,000 meter elevation gradients in the equatorial Andes and relied on museum collections in, in Ecuador to, to assess how, how changes in predation across elevations shape communities. And we looked at communities of invertebrates, particularly tree hoppers. So three hoppers are a group that is very, very close to my heart. <laughs> and, and they are mostly recognized by, uh, by the incredibly, uh, incredible morphological diversity of their thorax, as you may see in this array of pictures. And believe me, Google them, you won't be disappointed. Some, some of these bugs are borderline, borderline uh, science fiction, to be honest. But what is most important 
to, to this project is, is the diversity of three hopper behavioral strategies, which involve uh, a combination of various levels of maternal care, as we can see in the, in the photograph on the left. And, and various levels of, of their propensity to engage in mutualistic associations with ants, as we can see on their right. Yeah. So the, oh, sorry, these strategies are, are, are very closely associated with how a species adapt to predation. Okay. So three hopper species associating with ants exhibit the classic antimitran mutualism where three hoppers offer honeydew to the ants in exchange of obtaining their, their, their defensive services against other predators, right? As, as, as aphids in the, in, the, in, the, in the backyard. Now, three hoppers uh, with maternal care, uh, here mothers actively defend their, brood, uh, uh, defend their brood against predators and, and parasitoids, as we can see in the video. And they use a combination of behaviors that range from simply sitting on top of their eggs or, or to sophisticated communication behaviors that help mothers engage, engage predators with an array of attacks. Yeah. So we studied three hopper anti-predator behaviors along the Andes elevation and gradient where communities are exposed to different levels of, of, of predation and availability of hand partners. And we expected a three hopper anti-predator investment to be proportional to the predation pressure they, they I mean, they, they would encounter across elevations and whether they invest in maternal care and mutualism would be dependent on the presence of ants. And so to do this, we, we identified the three hopper communities occurring across elevations. And to do that, we used the, 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 the QCAZ Museum collection at La Pontificia Universidad Católica in, 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 in Ecuador. And this collection has been recording Ecuadorian biodiversity for over 50 years. And it houses over 9,000 specimens of three hoppers. Uh, including more than 500 species collected in over 400 locations all over Ecuador. So, and this is also an institution that is very close to my heart. I've worked there for many years. So this is what we did. So we used natural history information of species to assess the anti predator investment of communities across elevations. And this is, it is worth to mention that natural history, the collection of natural history is another, another one of the great the great efforts of long-term data collection. Since the dawn of, of humanity, we've been looking at plants and animals and just recording what they are doing. And in the case of three hoppers, there is a big body of literature that describing the behaviors and the, 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 the I mean, all, all, all natural history aspects of these animals. So as I mentioned before, the anti predator investment of three hoppers revolves around strategies involving combinations of, of maternal care and then mutualism at different life stages. And this is these strategies can be broadly categorized in, in, in the categories depicted in, in this table, right? So here, the rows depict the degree of investment in non-mutualism, ranging from no investment at the top, a mutualism limited just to the nymphal stages at the middle, and mutualism across all life stages at the bottom. And the columns, on the other hand, depict investment in maternal care. Uh, again, ranging from no investment uh, at the left, maternal care limited to the X stage in the middle, and maternal care of X and nymphs to the right. And we use this information to score each species overall anti predator investment, and then assess the total anti predator investment in the community. Okay. Okay, we also assess the ecological conditions tree hoppers encounter across elevations. Um, we did do this by sampling, as I said, 4,000 meter elevation gradients on the eastern and western slopes of, of Ecuador. And we used live fly baits to measure predation rates and the proportion of predation exerted by different, by different predators, predator types, right? And we also used sugary baits to measure the availability of mutual stands in the environment across elevations. Okay, uh, so let's see, this is what we find. And uh, this slide looks awful, sorry about that. <laughs> but the graph, we can see the graph. This, is, this, is, this, this graph depicts the, the, the probability of the baits being found by the ants per hour across elevations. And we can see that the availability of ant, ant partners just declines very sharply with elevation. Now with predation, the results are a little more interesting. Okay. Uh, so first of all, we can see that we found that predation rates on the live fly baits decrease with elevation, as we can see on the graph on the left. 
And this was mainly because a sudden decrease in ant predation, as we can see on the graph on the right. And the differential declines in this, in this predation rates by different predator types led to a qualitative shift in predation across elevations. And this graph, this graph shows the proportion of predation exerted by different predator groups across elevations. And we can see that the ants were dominant predators below 1500 meters, but got replaced by other predators above, the, above this elevation. Now, when we analyzed the types of anti-predator uh, investment across elevations, we found a qualitative shift in investment. In this graph, bars represent the, the proportion of species exhibiting of three hopper species, right? Different exhibiting different behavioral strategies within the community, right? So the legend at the right shows the color coding for the table depicting three hopper and the the strategies that, uh, that I described before. And here more intense blue depicts increasing investment of, in unmutualism and more intense yellows depict increasing investment in maternal care. And we can see that communities at the lowlands are dominated by species in, in, in a, a relying in unmutualism, right? But uh, communities in the highlands, on the other hand, are, are, are mostly dominated by species that rely on maternal care, and it's all, all there is all filled with yellow. So, so uh, this showed that maternal care is, I think it, it's, it's, it's working as an alternative, right, to, to, to an, as an alternative strategy to unmutualism. As ants become less available at higher elevations, uh, the uh, species began to begin to rely more and more on maternal care. However, we have to address an elephant in the room. And this is that we have shown that antry hopper mutualism is most frequent in the lowlands, but we have also shown that in the lowlands, ants are the dominant predators of invertebrates. So it's kind of a paradox there. So, and in fact, 96% of, of, of the ants that, that, that predated upon our, on our baits are belong to species that are known to associate with the meat ants. So we tested whether three, hopper, three hoppers invest on unmutualism or maternal care, and, and whether this was most closely associated with ant predation or the ants availability of mutualistic partners. And thank God, finally, there is a slide that looks okay. <laughs> in this graph, we see in the y-axis, the ratio of, of ant mutualism to maternal care investment within a three hopper community across elevations, meaning that that, that the points that are closer to one represent communities where most of the investment went to ant mutualism rather than maternal care. And the opposite would be true for, for points that are closer to zero where most, most investment goes to maternal care. So in the graph on the left, uh, this is plotted as a function of the availability of ants in the environment. And we can see that despite there is a positive association, the fit is, is it's a little off, right? On the graph on the right, on the other hand, investment is plotted as, as a function of how much of the total predation in the environment was exerted by the ants. And as we can see, the fit is, is nearly perfect. And, and I think this, this suggests that three hopper, three hopper and mutualism is, actual, is acting actually more as a strategy to pre prevent predation from the ants themselves rather than to uh, obtain their defensive services against predation as, as, as against other predators as it's usually understood, right? And, and this also shows that whether three hoppers investing in maternal care uh, or ant mutualism is an adaptation to qualitative changes in predation across elevations. All right, so it's a cool result. Now this is even cooler result. <laughs> we also found we also found that the overall anti-predator investment on, in three hopper communities did not decrease at the same rate as predation rates across elevations. Actually, not at all. In this graph, we can see in the, in, in the line in red that anti-predator investment decreased only above 2,500 meters. It decreased sharply. And this was despite an abrupt decrease in predation rates, which are virtually, virtually nothing above 1,500 meters, right? Uh, almost, it looks like the curves are actually mirrored. So this pattern suggests that low, 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 the low predation rates at high elevations are, are still ecologically relevant for the tree hoppers to, for the tree hoppers to justify in their communities, this sustained anti-predator investment, right? And but the, the, the story doesn't then end, doesn't end there because something happens above 2,500 meters that communities seem to not, not require to defend against, against predators anymore. Okay, so we think that this, this pattern could have raised because 
Okay, this is the thing with microecological gradients. Elevation is fundamentally a gradient of temperature and primary productivity, which are, not, are, are, which are variables that are known to have universal effects in ectotherms across all trophic levels universally. So the, the metabolic theory of ecology predicts that lower temperature and productivity at higher, that, as those occurring at higher elevations should lead to lower predation rates, yes, but it should also limit at the, at the very same rate the prey activity and their ability to replenish their numbers. So as elevation increases, the negative effects of, of predators and in predators and prey should, may, may actually cancel out. And so, but however, at, at, at the highest elevation, productivity may, may long no, no longer be able to sustain a predator trophic level, and which may release tree hoppers, tree hoppers from, from the, the need to invest against predation. And that's why we find this deep at the at the very highest elevations. Um, well, this is all I have to say for today. I hope I hope you found the study interesting. Thank you for your attention. Uh, well, I also want to thank all, all my collaborators and, and, the, and the funding agencies that made this study possible. And I'm sorry for all the glitches. <laughs> I'm using a free version of PowerPoint. <laughs> but thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Luis. What a fascinating set of uh, studies and a great, great story. Um, I have tons of questions and I know Matthew has a few too. And we'll, I encourage our audience to also submit questions, but I'd like to start you off uh, with, mm -hmm. uh, I was just thinking, so you showed that three by three diagram of all the possible strategies. And for a few of the boxes, you didn't, you know, we don't see species that have those levels of maternal care and mutualisms. And so I was curious mm -hmm. uh, if you could speculate on what might limit all of these possible strategies from evolving. Yeah, I mean, the, of course, those, those, those boxes don't exist or at least haven't been found in, in, right. in, in the field ever. Uh, the, first, the first obvious, a reason I think why they don't exist, for instance, the, the one that the maternal care, this maternal care is present throughout the whole stages and, and mutualism is present throughout those stages. Maybe that one doesn't exist because it's an overkill. Why so much investment? You don't, you need just enough, right? Then the other reason why I, I don't think that there is, um, uh, the thing is that if, if mothers are there, there's no way they can avoid new, there's, there's no way they can avoid ants unless ants are not present. Uh, that's why the, the few things that occur with maternal care at the, at the lowlands have to be with, with, with yeah. But definitely the, to answer that question, there's so many things that, that yeah. Oh yeah. But okay. yeah, that, yeah. Thanks that's for speculating a, a bit. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have a, a question from Patrick Green. Uh, mm -hmm. He asks, what is the range of a given treehopper community, especially at middle air altitudes? Could treehoppers at higher elevation, uh, elevations be holding on to anti-predator strategies from lower elevation, elevation, even if they don't need to? Yeah, actually the, the, the shift in, 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 in treehopper communities is actually, I would say almost total every 1000 meters, almost completely. Um, of course, there is always those species that have these ridiculous elevation gradients, but the ranges, but they are usually the ones that avoid to deal with maternal care and mutualism or are just hopping around like regular insects. So, yeah, uh, although I have thought about that, that, that idea and, and it may tell part of the story, at least for some species. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, fascinating system. Okay. Uh, I think we'll finish up with one question from Matthew. So Matthew. Uh, so, well, I was just wondering, so, you know, the classic story is that the, the ants are preventing other forms of predation. Are they still doing that? Is, is that story tr still true? It's just that the primary form of predation is from the ants? Yeah, uh, definitely the services are not mutually exclusive. Okay. Uh, this, this idea that the ants are, are, are actually the ones, the, the ant predation is the, the main services. I'm, 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 I'm publishing around it and I'm making some studies around it. And the thing is that it's, it's, it's kind of obvious, even if ant predation is not very, very high in an environment. If ants are predators, whether they are abundant or not, and if an ant is going to attend me, I have to first uh, convince it not to eat me in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's important to remember that the nipterans are kind of 
they are not very, very mobile if they are feeding because they are inserting their stylets mm -hmm. on the plant. It's not like they can just... So it's very useful to not to have to move every time an ant finds you. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. We're going to move on to the next talk Thank now. You. Um, I'm very pleased to now introduce our second speaker, Dr. Leticia Aviles. Uh, Leticia is a professor at, of zoology at the University of British Columbia, and research in her lab addresses the causes and consequences of evolutionary transitions between individuals and social groups. She asks these questions in a phylogenetic diverse set of social spiders that exhibit cooperative behavior. And she asks these questions using integrative methods, including long-term data collection, fieldwork, behavioral assays, molecular techniques, computer simulations, and analytical modeling. And this is a really fascinating study system, which enables Leticia and her lab to ask questions that are at the forefront of the field, including those about the causes and consequences of social evolution, multi-level selection, consequences of inbreeding, and the evolution of life histories and metapopulations. So today I'm thrilled to welcome her and hear more about social spiders. And your screen looks great. Great, thank you so much, Liz. And thank you both of you for having set up this wonderful seminar series. It's been a lot of fun to watch some of the seminars. Um, so I'm gonna be, and I'm also thrilled to be able to share um, uh, some of the research that I've been doing for over 40 years on social spiders. And um, I will start with the first species and if I can get my next screen there. The first species of social spider that I ever met is this species Analosimus eximius shown on the graph there on the, on the photos. And it's a species that I was introduced to when I was an undergraduate in Ecuador at the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Ecuador. And that's the group of classmates taking the course. And that's me practically a kid back then in 1978. And with the research that I started doing already as an undergraduate, I published my first paper on social spiders on this species when I just had entered grad school. And so that was my first publication ever in 1986. And since then I have continued working on social spiders. I first by myself and then with students, with postdocs, at several universities, different topics, different questions. And we are still going strong and not getting bored and very excited about the next question that we are dealing with. So after this species, I was fortunate during the time that I was doing work in the field to discover other spiders that had not been described as social before. So I'm showing you the pictures of these other species in a completely different family, very beautiful spider. Yet another species here in the um, top part of the graph, which is very interesting because this is a spider that belongs to a family that is normally a wandering spider. But in this uh, particular genus, they have evolved a web and it's there that we have a social spider having arisen. And yet another, uh, so another publication with that one. And I'm missing, so here there is another uh, species that I worked with um, more recently, this time published with a postdoc uh, and a collaborator at the University of British Columbia. And I'd like to start by thanking Dr. Chite de Bries, who was the instructor of that field ecology course that got me to get to know the social spiders. And also because he has been instrumental in sponsoring um, students at the university there working on research projects with my life and with my students. And I am very thankful for that and for the wonderful students that have worked on projects uh, with the social spiders. Um, so these are students at the university in Ecuador. Then uh, there have been a number of students at the University of Arizona where I was before moving to the University of British Columbia where I'm currently and where there have been a number of students also working on projects on social spiders. Today, I'm actually going to be focusing mostly on some of the older work that I've done that I haven't talked about in a long time, but I'd like to sort of give an overview of the many interesting and amazing things that one can learn by studying social spiders. So what are the social spiders? You probably know that most of the spiders are solitary. Here's a typical solitary species. In this case, the social spiders belong to families and genera where they build these irregular webs. 
So here is a very small web, the spiders, the spiderlings that may close from this, from the egg sac, and this web are going to disperse soon after a closing from the egg sac. But in some cases, the offspring may remain together for a while along with the mother and cooperate in maintaining this communal nest, uh, share their food, but they disperse prior to reproduction. And so in this case, the colonies contain a single family and just a few dozen individuals. But in the social species, the ones that we refer to as social, the spiders remain together throughout their lives and they do so from one generation to the next. So the colonies can grow depending on the species and the location to contain a few hundred individuals, a few thousand individuals, even tens of thousands, uh, thousands of individuals as this nest that we can see here covering the crown of a couple of trees that I photographed in the rainforests of Ecuador. And here's a list of all the social spiders that we know. So it is not, not a very long list, but it's a very diverse list in terms of phylogenetic distribution. So there are species belonging to different families, different genera. And if you can see here from the distribution, they are all found in tropical areas of the world. Despite their phylogenetic diversity, they have evolved um, convergent social behaviors. So they all build some sort of communal nest. They cooperate in maintaining this nest, they cooperate in prey capture, they share their food, and they have communal root care. But I think what makes the spiders particularly interesting is the ways in which they are different from other social organisms. So unlike the eusocial insects, for instance, they lack reproductive castes. Within colonies, you have multiple females that are reproducing, having their offspring. So it is a cooperative breeding system with plural breeding. But also, unlike most social organisms, they are highly inbred with female bias sex ratios. And the reason this happens is because, at least the immediate reason why this happens is because males and females remain in the natal nest to mate. And they do this generation after generation. So the colonies that um, may contain um, just a few individuals, after a couple of generations, they may grow to contain tens of thousands of spiders and as shown in this, uh, figure here. And when they do this, they, the, these colonies grow, they may disperse to produce daughter colonies or they may go extinct, but they do this with very little or no mixing with one another. Colonies that reach a relatively large size give rise to daughter colonies. And this may happen by a process that may involve explosive growth and then explosive dispersal. Um, for instance, in this species, again, from a small colony, it may have grown over a generation or two to contain about a few thousand spiders. And then at some point they disperse and they establish new colonies, either on their own or just joined by a couple of other individuals. Or in other species, and this is this wonderful yellow spider that I showed you earlier, the colonies actually reproduce by fission. And in this particular species, um, this a fission type of life cycle is associated with a nomadic phase. So the spiders, uh, after fission has happened and before establishing, a, producing a new generation of offspring, they disperse together, they wander in the forest, single file, uh, and they may do this for several weeks and hundreds of meters within the forest until eventually at some point they settle and then they start a new generation. Another aspect uh, of the biology of these spiders is, that's very intriguing is that the fact that they, they have a high rate of colony extinction. In some species, this may reach to 70% of, of the colonies going extinct every generation. And this extinction process involves not only small, but also large colonies, which is interesting. So we may ask uh, a few questions about social spiders, why do they have the bias sex ratios? Why the strong population subdivision? Why the high rates of colony extinction and unstable dynamics? And also why do they live in groups? 
And in trying to address these questions, and I'm actually listed here, listed them here in the order in which I actually started working on them. The spiders have taken me on a journey through different fields of evolution and ecology. And I just like to sort of make a list of those topics that I have worked on, inspired and intrigued by the biology of the social spiders. So sex ratio evolution in subdivided populations, inbreeding and its consequences, and stable population dynamics, the evolution of group living and cooperation, and more recently, the role of behavior in community assembly. I will not uh, have time to talk about the last topic, but I will uh, sort of give a brief overview of the first four topics. So starting with the first one, sex ratio evolution in subdivided populations. Already as an undergraduate, like actually the project that we had to do was count the number of males and females in the colonies. And it was pretty obvious that there were many more females than males, about a ratio of about 10 to one. But then the question was, is it because the males left, the males died, or is actually something really interesting going on and perhaps the spiders are violating um, this principle of evolutionary biology that predicts that the sexes should be produced more or less in equal numbers. So to address this with um, Wayne Madison, we looked at sexing developing embryos, which we can do in spiders because they have a difference in chromosome number between males and females. And by doing so, we were able to demonstrate that the female male bias sex ratios that we see in colonies are actually primary sex ratio biases. And since this first study that we published in 91, there have been a number of other studies demonstrating that sex ratios in the social spiders are in fact highly female biased. And there is a recent study that shows that the bias is already in the sperm production with the sperm being the heterogametic sex. So why do they have sex ratios that violate what's known as Fisher's sex ratio principle? And what I have worked uh, with, the hypothesis that I worked with actually for my uh, doctoral dissertation was that because of the extreme population subdivision and the high colony turnover of the spiders, this would create the conditions for colony level selection to bias the sex ratios. And this was actually George Williams' idea when he published the, his book in 1966, where he argued against the importance of group level selection in evolution, he said, if, sex, uh, if group level selection were important, we would see bias sex ratios in nature more often than we do. And he said, suggested, because producing more females would increase the growth rate and therefore the survival and other productivity of a group or population. Well, it may just be that the spiders are exactly an example of this kind of phenomenon going on. But for selection to happen at the level of the colonies, the colonies need to meet Darwin's four postulates for evolution by natural selection. So that is, they need to be many of these colonies that die and reproduce. And from what I described you before, this is exactly what happens with the social spiders. There also needs to be variability that is heritable variation among the colonies and the groups must maintain these heritable differences. And the last condition is that whatever traits may be being selected by selection at the colony level should increase um, group success. So let's look at some of the evidence for these last two conditions. We have looked uh, at molecular markers of many of the, several of the social spiders. And, ooh, this one skipped, okay. And, but this is just an, one example of a study. This one was done with a postdoc um, here at the University of British Columbia, where we looked at mitochondrial DNA. And what we see here is the different haplotypes of uh, mitochondrial DNA for different colony clusters here on the landscape. And what we see is that they are different haplotypes, but they are all clusters. So colonies that happen together have the same haplotype, but groups that may not be that far from each other are fixed to a different haplotype. So this is, and then within colonies, individuals are practically identical to one another at mitochondrial markers and also microsatellite markers. Not in microsatellite markers, there is a little bit more of variability because of higher mutation rates. 
But the main point is that the variability in social spider populations is contained between colonies rather than within colonies, which is consistent with groups maintaining heritable differences that would allow selection to act on colonies as units. The other condition was that the, these differences should be correlated with group success. And for the case of sex ratio, and according to Williams hypothesis, having more female bias sex ratios should make it more likely for a group to produce daughter groups. And that's what we see data that I collected for my uh, PhD thesis shows that the colonies that give rise to these dispersal events are the colony are only the larger colonies. The smaller colonies do not disperse. And with computer simulations, I was able, able to show that in order for this sex ratios to become biased, this group level advantage needs to be maintained. So we have a simulation here to the right. We have a meta population of colonies going extinct and high inbreeding going on and all of this. And there is an advantage because for, to produce female bias sex ratios because only large colonies proliferate. And in this case, we see that sex ratios evolve to be highly female biased. But if we take the group level advantage by making all colonies equally likely to proliferate as in the figure below, then in that case, we see that female bias sex ratios cannot evolve despite the degree of uh, population subdivision in breeding and turnover and all of that. So basically what uh, this data suggests is that the spiders fulfill the conditions that would make selection at the level of the colonies explain their highly female bias sex ratios. So the uh, take home message here is strong population subdivision and high rate of colony turnover in social spiders appears to create the conditions for intercolony selection to be strong enough to select for and maintain highly female bias sex ratios. And so social spiders may be an example of this form of selection that was very controversial back in the day in the 80s and 70s. And here's a quote for Egbert Lee, where he says, if there, there were to be selection at the level of the groups, a, a quantitative trait has a reasonable chance of overriding selection within populations if and only if the populations never exchange migrants, each population is founded by colonies from a single parent population, and the number of populations exceeds the effective number of reproductive individuals per population. And he might as well have written these about social spiders because that's exactly what they are like. But now the next question is why are they like these? So why have they evolved such highly subdivided population structure? And for these, I'd like to refer to the um, uh, work of Peter Wasser, who um, showed with analytical models that inbreeding, which is what the spiders are doing, should be tolerated when the costs of inbreeding avoidance exceed the costs of inbreeding depression. So the next task was to try to figure out and so that happened in the past, how will we observe it today? And so here's basically a sort of cartoon representation of um, the prediction of Peter Basser. And so this leads me to the next topic, which is inbreeding and its consequences. And we're fortunate that the species, the social spiders, the inbred social spiders have related subsocial species that I, I introduced you already before, where the colonies consist of single family groups, but dispersal happens prior to mating and they are outbred. And we believe from phylogenetic uh, evidence that these subsocial species are like we envisioned the ancestral species would have been from which the social spiders originated. So we can use some of the extant species to try to estimate how much inbreeding depression might, have, might there be if these spiders were to switch to inbreeding. So we have done this with a species in Arizona where I was for several years, so took advantage of the spiders being not too far from the university there. And so we worked on artificially inbreeding these naturally outbred subsocial species. And with a postdoc at the University of Arizona, Todd Bukowski, we made it a ton of 
siblings with each other and then as control non-related individuals with each other. Then we put these inbred or outbred clutches back in the field. And then we follow their development and measure different traits to compare whether there was a difference between the inbred and the outbred spiders. So we measure things like offspring size, uh, offspring survival to two different points in their life cycle. We measure time to maturity and size to maturity. And we found no evidence of inbreeding depression during the early phases of the life cycle, but there was significant inbreeding depression in terms of um, time to maturity and size of maturity with the inbred spiders taking longer to mature and being also smaller when they mature. So with our data, um, and I just will sort of just give you the number without giving you the details of how we got there. We estimated that in breeding depression where these species to transition to inbreeding from being uh, originally outbred would range between 0 0.1 and 0 0.4. So now we need to sort of see how this is what inbreeding depression might be. What about inbreeding avoidance? So cost of avoiding inbreeding um, for the social spiders may involve two things. One is dispersing from the natal nest, uh, say a sub, a sub adults like the subsocial spiders do. And um, also, uh, missing out on the benefits of being in a group once they have dispersed. Since the social species do not disperse as subadults, we measure dispersal in the outbred subsocial spider in the temperate zone uh, with the understanding that whatever estimate we get for the cost of dispersal, there would be much less than we might expect would happen in the lowland rainforest, where for some reason the spiders do not disperse, probably because it is just not this it's just not possible, they wouldn't survive at all. And then we also measure what the cost would be of living solitarily, in this time looking at the social spider in the native tropical environment, because those spiders do occasionally establish uh, nests on their own and we can also manipulate colony size to estimate uh, fitness for colonies of different sizes. So looking first at dispersal costs for the subsocial spider in an environment where dispersal happens naturally. We find that nonetheless, there's high mortality uh, during the dispersal phase. So close to 90% of females and over 90% of males do not survive the dispersal phase. So with that, we can estimate comparing that mortality with the mortality that we observe within colonies of the social spider, because there is always going to be some mortality. So the difference between the two gives us this estimate, estimated cost of dispersal for females and males. And so this is a cost that in the transition to uh, the inbred system, the spiders would spare. And the other cost that we talked about was um, not getting the benefit of being in a group. So for that, we can comp compare the reproductive success of females that live in groups with that of females that live solitarily. So comparing the, these two quantities, you can see there's quite a bit of a difference there we estimate what would be the cost of giving up being in a group. Combining these two costs of avoiding inbreeding gives us an estimated cost of inbreeding avoidance of 0 0.88 for females. For males, we don't have a direct estimate, but we suspect it is greater than what it, we calculated for females because males would also miss out on the opportunity of mating with the many females that they share their colonies with if they were to disperse. So this is our cost of inbreeding avoidance. This was the cost of inbreeding depression that we estimated before. And we see clearly that for the spiders, given that they transition into this environment where there are benefits of group living and high cost of dispersal, it is definitely much better to have gone the route of uh, inbreeding rather than maintaining an outbred system with these very high costs of inbreeding avoidance. So these might explain um, why there have been so many origins of these social spiders across the phylogenetic tree of, of spiders. It seems that the cost of inbreeding depression are not as bad compared to not uh, evolving these sort of inbred social systems. But so here we have um, a tree of all spiders showing on the numbers here, the number of independent origins of these inbred social species. 
And even here, this, is, this means in this clade here at the bottom, uh, there is 12 independent origins. It's just kind of all condensed in the family 3D there. So still there's many origins, but also very few species. So why is that? Okay, and that one skipped, all right. <laughs> so why so few species? Uh, so here we need to think about the long-term effects of inbreeding. So originally in the transition to inbreeding, there would have been purging of recessive deleterious alleles. And so that is a good thing, but eventually you end up with individuals and colonies and populations that are highly homozygous. They have low genetic variability, and this would lead to low adaptability to change in environments and poor pathogen resistance. And so one could argue that these inbred lineages could become evolutionary dead ends. And what evolutionary dead ends look like is this sort of spindly phylogenetic distribution. Just one species here, one species there, which is what we see in the case of the social spider. So the phylogenetic distribution of this inbred social system is consistent with this inbred spider sociality being an evolutionary dead end. So take a message from this section, why the strong population subdivision, a shift to an inbred social system would have been, would have occurred because benefits of group living and cost of dispersal exceed the cost of inbreeding depression in environments where the inbred social species occur. Now, moving on to the question of unstable population dynamics, which basically has to do with why is there such a high rate of colony extinction? And I mentioned before that this extinction involves not only small colonies, but also large colonies. And here is an example. So this extinction of these large colonies seems to be associated with the boom and bust kind of pattern. So one can observe col a colony grow really fast to a very large size to then only watch it kind of disintegrate and go extinct without giving any descendant colonies. So that's me back in the day, 1984, documenting the extinction of these um, uh, large social spider colony. So why is this happening? And so this brings me to a bit of theory of population dynamics, which was pioneered among others by uh, Robert May, which suggests that, uh, and the idea is that, that I work with is that this boom and bust pattern of colony growth and high rate of extinction was due to intrinsic dynamical instability. And this is expected if the following conditions are met. So there is negative density dependence, discrete generations, and large rates of growth. Um, so I showed you earlier that there is density dependence uh, as a function of colony size in social spiders, female reproductive success here. And the reason this curve comes down is because some components of fitness decrease as a function of colony size. So there is negative density dependence. Just for completion, here are the other components of fitness. So there is also a benefit of being in group in terms of uh, the proportion of surviving offspring increasing with colony size. So they have negative density dependence. They do have discrete generations. I will not be able to show you the data right now for that. And they have large rates of growth. And the large rates of growth can happen for several reasons. But in this case, I'd like to sort of highlight uh, high rates of growth resulting from uh, high levels of cooperation. So here we are, and the consequences that they may have that may have on population dynamics. So here we are looking at a representation of the size of a population in times t plus one as a, as a function of its size in the previous generation. And we have these different curves here. And the difference between them is that if we increase cooperation, that has the effect of pulling this function and making it taller, but it's at the same time that it is getting taller, it's also becoming steeper as it does this 45 degree line. And it, it turns out that the predicted dynamics of a population depend on the slope of that function. So if it is a very shallow function like this one, the prediction is that there will be growth to a point equilibrium. At some point, there's gonna be a transition to oscillations. And then eventually as the function becomes even steeper, there may be a transition to what has been described as chaotic dynamics. And I think, and we are still working on this, that this is what may be happening with the social spiders that may explain why they have these sort of boom and bust dynamics and high rates of colony extinction. And so here's some of the evidence. Uh, 
a reconstruction of the same function shown before in the other graphs, but with actual data here, definitely more noise. Ignoring these points here, which are colonies that dispersed, we see that the slope of the reconstructed function is steeper than minus one, which would predict intrinsic dynamical instability. So this is one of the species in the rainforest. Another species, similar story, a very steep slope predicting again and intrinsic dynamical instability. So what's going on? Why are these spiders going, why are they not dispersing to prevent extinction? So there are all these colonies that went extinct here, but there were a few that did disperse. So why is this not happening more often? And what I think it's happening here is that there are two things. Because of discrete generations, these spiders are only able to disperse when they have reached reproductive maturity. And also because the high costs of dispersal and the high benefits of being in a group in the environments where these social spiders occur, so in the lowland tropical rainforest, will sort of result in a function that keeps them trapped within colonies because they can't disperse, they just wouldn't make it and they have a benefit of staying together. So they, one of the consequences of that because of this boom and bust dynamics is some rate of colony extinction that it is compensated at some point with some uh, dispersal. But if we go to a, another habitat, we can go up in elevation where the costs of dispersal are not as high, the benefits of group living are not as high, we might predict that the dispersal may happen more frequently and the dynamics will be less unstable. And this is what happens if we go to uh, this higher elevation area, mid elevation, there is a different species here, it makes smaller colonies. And in this case, we look at the probability of colony dispersal and if dispersal is fairly common and the size of the colonies is not that large. So in this case, these species doesn't have the boom and bust dynamics than the species in the lowland rainforest have. So take a message from this part, why the unstable colony dynamics, increased rates of growth arising from benefits of cooperation combined with negative density dependence and discrete generations can lead to intrinsically driven boom and bust dynamics. And now finally to the question that, um, you know, many people wonder is why have they evolved to be social? So this leads me to the last topic that I'm gonna touch on today, which is the evolution of group living and cooperation. And so I showed you earlier that there are some benefits of being in group despite costs. The outcome is a function that predicts maximum fitness at some intermediate colony size. And this is something that we observed across the board in social organisms when all factors are taken into account. And I would suggest that it is this humped fitness function that explains why group living happens. But then the question is, what are the factors that lead to these humped functions? And I would suggest that this may vary across different uh, taxonomic groups, different social systems, but that the principle of this humped fitness function may apply to all of them. But there is two different ways that you can get this humped function. One way would be, uh, so we're looking here at fitness as a function of group size. It would be a species that may be doing just fine in a particular habitat, but if there is a resource that they can access by cooperating, by being in groups and cooperating, that would increase their fitness to create this, this hump. And an example of that may be the tree killing bark beetles, which are sitting in this forest with all these live trees that they could colonize if only they could attack them. And that's what some of the tree killing bark beetles have evolved is an ability to aggregate, to kill weakened trees so that they can colonize them. But another way of getting to a function like that is if the fitness is actually being pulled down at small colony sizes, and this would happen for species that are occupying some harsh and challenging environment. And being social and being in a group may allow them to address this environmental challenge. And an example of that may be the naked mole rats that live in these extremely arid environments in Africa, where um, they need to sort of have very short 
periods of time when they can find the next batch of resources to move on. And the only way they can do it is if multiple individuals are simultaneously digging. So they are living in a, as part of a group. So to sort of understand what might be the factors responsible for um, uh, group living and cooperation in the spiders, we go back now and look at what the environmental factors may be. And so first clue, they are all tropical. Second clue within the tropics, they are concentrated at the lower elevation. So here we see the social species shown in red, they are found only in the tropics and within the tropics at the lower elevations, they are absent from higher elevations and higher latitudes. Whereas the subsocial species here shown in blue have the opposite pattern. They are absent from the lowland rainforest and they are present at higher elevations and higher latitudes. So there are these two patterns that we need to explain. Why are the subsocial species absent from the lowland tropical rainforest? And why are the social species restricted to the lower elevation wet tropics? So that is the environmental factor, but there is always an interaction with features of the organisms. And uh, my suggestion is that the key feature that explains why sociality has evolved in certain uh, genera and spider families, it is the type of web webs that they build. All the spiders, um, all these social spiders build some sort of irregular and except with one exception, three-dimensional web. So this is just pictures of the different uh, uh, webs in different genera and we see, and so we would suggest, I would suggest that first in a regular web is a shareable resource. It is also a valuable resource. It requires a lot of silk investment to build it and maintain it. So there should be a cost to replace it that may select for being together in a group and also it offers protection against predators and the elements. So it's another reason why it may work in certain habitats. And these three-dimensional webs should be subject to scaling laws of three-dimensional objects. So to um, make many stories short, uh, the first question is why are the subsocial species absent from the lowland tropical rainforest? So these are the blue points, the species that live in single family groups. And the two factors that we have identified in the environment that may be responsible for that is, pre is precipitation rate. So it rains much, much harder in the lowland tropical rainforest than it does at the higher elevations. So that, that would be the first thing, the graph to the left. And then predation rate, which is the, what Luis just showed, this is actually a graph from his work. Uh, that predation rate is much stronger at the lower elevations and in the wet tropics than it is at the higher elevations. So these two factors in interaction with these dense webs would predict that group living is necessary because a single female uh, with her offspring would not be able to maintain the web in good condition in places where it rains very hard, and it would also not be able to defend the offspring from predators on her own. And it would be better off sharing the nest, be having a bigger nest that is shared with other females that can help in brood care. So we have some done some uh, experiments to test these hypotheses. Um, and so a master student uh, at UBC transplanted a subsocial spider colonies from to the lowland from the mid elevation where it naturally occurs to the lowland rainforest. It transplanted some nests within the native site as controls, and then it protected the webs. Some in various treatments, protected from the rain, protected from predators. Only one or the other or neither of those protections. And what we found is that at the higher elevation, first survival of the colonies is greater, there is no effect of um, the, these different protections, suggesting that, that at that elevation, predation and rain are not a problem. But at the low elevation, on the other hand, those colonies that were protected from the rain or predators survive significantly better than those that were left unprotected. And the other thing that we found, so this would be the factors that may be responsible for this, but also in, in uh, other studies as I showed you before, what we found also is that the spiders that would happen to be in very small colonies, single individuals or pairs, 
are actually below replacement value. So they do happen occasionally, but they don't do very well on average. And we see that this happens in these two spider species in the lowland rainforest, which basically shows that the reason why the spiders are social is because if they weren't social, the species in this particular genera with these dense webs, they couldn't occupy the habitats that they occupy. And this was actually a bit of a surprise for me because I originally thought, oh, they are social because they are these big insects that they could access if they were in groups. But it turns out that it is actually that they couldn't be there unless they live in a group. So, now the other question is why are the social species restricted to the low elevation wet tropics? So we don't find them at higher elevations or higher latitudes. And here, another long story short, what we have found is that it, it seems to be, it is the size of the insects that makes the difference. So the insects at low elevations, and here showing nocturnal and diurnal insects, insects at the low elevations are much larger. We have a log scale here than insects at the mid elevation or high elevation. And we see here different data sets showing that at the higher elevations, these large insect size classes are for the most part missing. And the reason for this is the scaling of three-dimensional objects. Because of this scaling, what we expect is that as the colonies get bigger, the nests get bigger, the surface area to volume ratio decreases, and that should correlate with the number of prey that enter the colonies per spider because number of prey contact in the web is proportional to the surface, but the number of spiders is proportional to the volume. And so we have that the number of insects per capita decreases with colony size, both in the rainforest and at the high elevation. But if you are in an area with large insects, the size of the insects that the colony capture by cooperating increases with colony size, and this results in biomass per capita peaking at some intermediate colony sizes. Whereas at the higher elevations with no large insects available, biomass per capita decreases with colony size, which would explain why they disperse rather than remain together to produce a new generation. Whereas here, they remain to produce very large colonies. And again, here we have a log scale on the x-axis. So maybe they are not social with the purpose of capturing big insects, but big insects end up being necessary in order for the spiders to occupy certain environments. And fortunately, rain and insects and large insects, strong rains and large insects come together in the tropical rainforest, which would explain why the social spiders can be there. And so there are these factors uh, that seem to, that say would like a filter to explain where social spiders can happen and cannot happen and where the social spiders cannot happen and where they can happen. And in this case, it seems to be rain, predators, insect size. But I would suggest that there are gonna be a similar combination of factors that is, may, may explain sociality in other organisms. And that regardless of what the specifics of each case are, it is going to all boil down to one of these two functions that may explain the diversity of social systems and why social group living and cooperation has arisen across the board. And with that, I would like to um, thank you who anybody who's present right now during the presentation, anybody who may watch the video later. I would like to acknowledge my funding sources in Canada, the US, uh, the collaboration of many institutions in Ecuador, Brazil, the field stations and the native lands and here are some of the pictures of the pictures of the wonderful people that have been like my family doing uh, our work in the tropical rainforest. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. That was an amazing talk as always. Um, all right, so we have one question in the Q and A so far. Um, Bill Marshall says, "Great talk, thank you." Is it correct that the extreme sex ratios can only evolve when dispersal is infrequent? Are you able to test whether that is the order of evolution using phylogenetic methods? Um, so as long as there is no mixing between the colonies, yes. We actually, like in, along with that simulation, uh, I, I also simulated the what would happen to different degrees of gene flow between the colonies. And it actually, things get swamped pr pretty quickly. By the time you get to 5% of the individuals moving between colonies, you cannot evolve via sex ratios anymore. And um, 
So I don't know whether one would test that using phylogenetics, but looking at populations in the field, there are some species that seem to have partial inbreeding and the sex ratios are much less biased. So there is some, uh, a, a fraction of the individuals seem to remain and inbreed within colonies, but a large fraction disperses and probably outbreed. And in those cases, there is only slight bias present. So it would be more like looking across different species and then in different genera and, and yeah. Great, I had a follow-up question on the sex ratio piece. I was curious, is the sex ratio in the subsocial species one-to-one -one for males and females? Yeah, it is one-to-one. -one. Yeah, and we have uh, looked at that both using the chromosomes and just looking at the number of males and females in colonies and it is one-to-one. -one. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating mm -hmm. trait. Um, I think Matthew also has a question. Yeah, I had a question about, um, uh, so I'm thinking about how you, you've shown that there's this balance between inbreeding, depression, and the cost of dispersal. And so it makes total sense to me why females don't disperse. But I guess coming from, and this is partially biased by my kind of mammalian training, I guess I would expect females to evolve a preference for uh, males, outbred males, essentially. Um, do they have, do females have choice in this system? Are they able to choose who they mate with or, or does the lack of choice kind of prevent that preference formation? So yeah, that probably depends on the species. So the ones that are deep in the rainforest, the ones that are the most social, I don't think they, there's any, probably there are no males showing up. So they wouldn't mm -hmm. have the choice, but there are other species that are a bit more intermediate where there might be some, males showing up here or there. I I am not positive right now. I think that a couple of groups have looked to see whether there is a preference for unrelated males. I, uh, I may not be remembering correctly, but I think that they did not find evidence for that. So in species, for instance, in the genus Stegodiphus that are found in the old world, I think they did not find evidence for that. But that actually would make sense in systems where there is some chance that males may be moving around a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I have one maybe final question here. I was curious if you know anything about how the spiders assort themselves during these fission periods, like are more closely related individuals in the colonies more likely to disperse into these daughter groups or is there something else going on? Yeah. You know, they are so inbred and so similar to each other. Like I, I have this data that I didn't get a chance to show today of microsatellites and it's just, it's like a clone. It's kind of crazy. So I don't think it matters because they are just pretty much the same. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. All right, well, with that, I'd like to thank you and Luis, who's not here anymore, uh, for two wonderful talks. Yes, round of applause. And I encourage everyone out there to tune in next week, same place, same time, for two more fascinating talks on long-term research. Thank you, and have a great day. Yeah. Thank you, guys.